Welcome to Sayanathivan Education Foundation once again. The only true wisdom is in knowing you know nothing. We started this educational program way back in 2007, releasing a, a set of brochures for an educational program from our institution. It was released by Professor Antonio Long of Italy. And uh, we launched the Sayanathivan Education Foundation in 2012. January, and it was inaugurated by Professor Sion Han Kim from Korea. Then we started having three fellowship programs, six months and one year fellowship program, which are hands on on basic and advanced laparoscopy surgeries, which are all free of cost. Recently, with the advent of COVID, we started online programs, and the logo was uh, launched by Professor Padanivelu from India. After that, we started having live surgeries in online platform. The first uh, live surgery was uh, in Facebook Live, that was laparoscopic and resection. Then we uh, Telecasted a live people in YouTube, a link was shared to the members of Sayanathi Education Foundation. Then from July onwards, we started having live lectures with world leaders like Professor Stephen Wetzner. We started international fellowship programs in lab SPB surgery, colorectal surgery, upper GA surgery, and therapeutic endoscopy, respectively in Japan, France, Korea, and India. This is the uh, Candidates who attended uh, international fellowship programs in Tokyo Medical University with Professor Nagaka Vichy. There were more than 400 applications from 68 countries for the next batch. Recently, we started chapters in uh, 48 countries with ambassadors in each country. And uh, we have presence in nearly 100 countries. And uh, we have collaboration with uh, many international universities. Our vision is disseminating skills and knowledge to our new university law for the benefit of the underprivileged society with uh, no geographical boundaries, with a zero financial motive, with a wider spectrum of population, so that a wider spectrum of population is benefited. Today, we are really, really blessed to have uh, one of the world leaders in surgery, especially colorectal surgery. He is editor-in-chief of surgery, member of the editorial movement, board member of numerous international index journals. He was the former chairperson of, vice chairperson of American College of Surgeons, former president of Sages. Has published more than 800 manuscripts, uh, contributed to more than 300 test books, contributed to more than 100 editorials. He is an international educator, researcher, innovator, and influencer. He is none other than Professor Stephen Wexner. I invite Professor uh, uh, Stephen Wexner to Sayanathipan Education Foundation. Uh, actually, I am inducted to you because in 2014, you only recommended me to Sages and uh, uh, you uh, gave me membership in Sages. And the program will be moderated by uh, Professor, uh, Dr. Prakash K, who is a lead senior consultant in GISTB surgery at Astor Medicity, Kochi, India. To formally introduce uh, the speaker and the moderator. Uh, Dr. Ashna is there, who is an associate consultant in uh, Astor Medicity, India. She is a surgical gastroenterologist. Uh, before inviting her for formal introduction, let me ask you to mute your mic on entry. If possible, kindly acknowledge by renaming your device by yours. Participants logging from outside India are requested to reveal their identity in the chat box. Raise your hand if you want to intervene uh, during the discussion. Everybody will be given permission to unmute their mic if they raise a hand. If you are on a portable device, please mute your audio and hide your video. 
certificates will be issued if you are participating for more than 80 percent of the screen time our next webinar will be on uh, uh, 5th of november on endohepatology by dr rajesh Puri. Uh, if you have any uh, doubts you can write to dr senadiman uh, at senadiman gmail.com um, may i invite dr ashna to introduce the speaker and the moderator formally very good evening to one and all. Myself, Dr. Ashna, I'm interested to introduce today's speaker and moderator. In fact, Professor Stephen D. Wexner needs no introduction. He's a world-renowned colorectal surgeon, currently the chairman of Cleveland Clinic, Florida, USA, in the, under the Department of Colorectal Surgery. Dr. Stephen received his bachelor's degree from the Columbia University in 1978. In 1982, he did his MD from the Wheel Connell Medicine. Thereafter, he did his general surgery residency in 1987 at the Roosevelt Hospital. Subsequently, he did his fellowship in colorectal surgery in 1988 at the University of Minnesota. To his credit, he has more than 35 years of surgical expertise, during which he has published over 800 manuscripts, 300 chapters, and hundreds of editorials. He is an international educator, researcher, and an innovator. He has been a member of the editorial board for numerous international index journals, the former vice chair of the American College of Surgeons, former president of the Sages, and the editor-in-chief of Surgery. His world-renowned groundbreaking modification, that is a J-pouch in ileoanal anastomosis, is, known, is well known to all of us and his Wexner scores, both the incontinence score and the constipation score are of great utility in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. Welcome, sir, to deliver today's talk on the importance of standards in rectal cancer care. And to moderate this session, let me call upon Dr. Prakash Ke, lead senior consultant, GI in HPV surgery, Astra Med City, Kochi. He has been trained in one of most of the, some of the best renowned institutions in Europe and India. And he himself has 25 years of expertise in numerous complex HPV and colorectal surgeries. His prime interest is in lab colorectal procedures and he has performed thousands of laparoscopic colorectal resections. He is in fact the first to perform the single incision laparoscopic colorectal resection in Kerala. He is undoubtedly the best person to moderate this session on this importance of standards in rectal cancer care. Welcome, sir, to moderate this session. Welcome, um, Professor Stephen Wexner and uh, Dr. Prakash. Over to Prakash. Good evening to one and all. First of all, let me thank Sanadipan Education Foundation and Dr. Paiju Sanadipan for giving me this opportunity. And once again, welcome, sir, for uh, this uh, educational forum and uh, we all know that you are an expert to deliver today's lecture and one of the field which is constantly changing and updating uh, in terms of uh, imaging to preoperative therapy to surgical therapies uh, rectal cancer and today uh, we are uh, talking about the standards in rectal care how to standards. So today's topic is going to be the most, uh, you are the most apt person to deliver today's uh, topic. So without wasting much time, let me invite uh, Professor Stephen Wexner to the topic that is important for standards in rectal care, rectal cancer care. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ashna, Dr. Prakash, and especially uh, to the Sanadipan uh, Foundation for including me today to give this lecture on one of the topics very near and dear to me that I've devoted to more than the last 10 years, really focusing on developing this program in the United States, as you'll see. So I will share my talk with you um, and talk about the importance of standards in rectal cancer care. Um, and as I say, this is uh, a, a labor of love. A lot of work went into this project, a lot of time, a lot of people, and as you'll see, a lot of organizations contributing to the success. To think about why we need standards, we need to first turn back the clock. You saw my brief bio sketch, and you know that I finished 
uh, my medical school training in 1982 and my general surgery residency in 1987. And, and during that time, it was very common to have local recurrence rates for rectal cancer that were double digit, <laughs> largely rates of around 20%. So one out of every five patients, even when adjuvant therapy was used, which in those days was post-operative radiation and post-operative chemotherapy. Local recurrence rates hovered around 20%. was very, very common, and that's what I grew up with. And the way surgery was done was more or less, of course, was open. There was no minimally invasive surgery in the 1980s until around uh, 1991 for colorectal surgery. People would, through a big incision, pretty much put a hand in the pelvis, would pull, a noise would be made as, as the whole rectum was kind of a bolt in the sacrum. And then clamps would go across the so-called lateral stalk, dividing on the clamps and tying, leaving behind all kinds of lateral tissue, posterior tissue. I mean, it was really a very different operation than we do today. Once Bill Heal introduced EME, and I was fortunate enough to become friendly with, with Bill Heal during 1980s, uh, think about this, uh, 80s, about 1984, uh, about 40 years ago, I was introduced to him by Stanley Goldberg. I was still a general surgery resident. Uh, I'm an Anglophile. I don't hide that. I'm busy at Cleveland Clinic London a bit these days. Um, and I try and go over there about once a quarter uh, to see what I can do. But in the meantime, uh, Bill knew that, and he knew my interest in colorectal, invited me to his home and his hospital in Basingstoke, England, 1984, scrubbing with him at the time and, and learning what he was doing. He revolutionized rectal cancer care because he explained to all of us the importance of taking out that mesorectal package with tumor-free radial margins, not putting clamps on the lateral stalks and sutured time, which I had been taught to do, but by careful, sharp dissection, scissors, it was his preference, diathermy later for many others, but a, a dissection to totally encompass that mesorectal package uh, with a high ligation of the inferior mesenteric artery, uh, high ligation of the veins, splenic flexion mobilization, reconstruction, and the local recurrence rate dropped down, as you can see, in the low single digits, because not only did Bill do it, but then John McFarlane from the University of British Columbia did a sabbatical with Bill had independently audited all the results and came up with a very similar number. Warren Anker at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York, Maria at the National Cancer Institute in Tokyo, uh, Scandinavia, Germany, New Zealand, Netherlands, Hong Kong, looking around the world, isolated local recurrence rates were much, much lower with TME. So the next set of problems looked at was who should be doing the TME and how many should be done? Now, those are difficult, vexing questions, but there are a couple of studies that really showed us the importance. So this one is a uh, Canadian study, and what they looked at was the number of uh, resections and training. So the lowest local recurrence rate was people who had trained in colorectal surgery and were doing a higher volume of resection. The worst outcome, almost a 50% local recurrence rate, almost 50%, was non-colorectal trained individuals um, performing a lower volume. Disease-specific survival followed a similar pathway, and, and somewhere in the middle for both local recurrence and disease-free survival, you had either the people who trained but didn't do that many or the people who didn't train but did more. They were intermediate between the extremes of best practice, colorectal training, high volume, worst practice, non-colorectal training, low volume. And when they looked at their surgeon variability and they looked at a hazard ratio, colorectal training and volume were right up there with things like perforation of the tumor and vascular or perineural invasion. So very, very important factor, who's doing it and how many are you doing? Helen Dorrance in the UK came up with a very similar finding that patients operated upon by a general rather than a colorectal surgeon were about three and a half times more likely to develop a local recurrence. 
the patients need to know these things. And when they're choosing a surgeon, am I going to go to somebody where I have a 3% local recurrence uh, rate risk or somebody where I'm going to have, you know, a, a 14 or 15% risk? Obviously, you want to pick the lowest risk. And that lowest risk is in part by how the operation is done technically. But as you'll see when we come to the standard, there are other factors. And more and more people around the world picked up on this theme. So Les Bouquet in, in Sydney, Australia, for example, found that surgeon vo increasing volume decreased mortality and recurrence. Uh, I showed you the Porter study a moment ago. Uh, this is a, a study from, the, from Maryland. This one is from New York. It includes breast as well. But you can see the similar themes as you go around the world uh, that Increasing volume is associated with decreased morbidity, decreased mortality, and very important for the purposes of the discussion today, decreased rate of local recurrence. So my focus has been on the U.S. and developing standards in the U.S., but how did we get there? So fast forward a little bit more from the mid-1980s to the mid-1990s, now into the 2000s, and a study by uh, Rocco Riccardi when he was a resident at the University of Minnesota used a nationwide inpatient sample, which is a 20% stratified random sample of U.S. inpatients over a 15-year period. And he found in that time over 40,000 patients had a radical proctectomy for cure. 60% of patients had a colostomy. That number seems absolutely exorbitant. 60% of patients in the U.S. with rectal cancer end with a colostomy. In this time period, when I was I started practice in 1988, a, a crazy high number. Now the rate did increase in, over the 15 years, up to 48 percent, but still the majority of patients were getting a colostomy in the U.S. and that seemed very inappropriate. Now it's possible that 52 percent of patients had tumors invading the anal sphincters and appropriately had a colostomy, but it Highly, highly, highly unlikely that's the case. And what Rocco went on to show in a, in a subsequent study when he, he moved to the Leahy Clinic, used the same data set as his other study, but he put in the characteristics from the SEER database, screening rates for Medicare, hospital characteristics in the American Hospital Association, and surgical specialty defining a colorectal specialist as somebody either as a fellow of the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons or as a fellow of the Society of Surgical Oncology, and some of us are fellows of both. And he then looked at what was called high stoma county, defined as higher than 60% colostomy rate. And in fact, in one quarter of counties in the U.S. of his sample, the mean was 71. So seven out of 10 patients walking out the door with a colostomy after their surgery for rectal cancer. There were some characteristics that were caused for concern or at least awareness because when there's concern, there's opportunity, but you need to identify the problem before you can fix it. So these high stoma counties were counties in which they were less likely to have. And again, there's a 2011 publication. So you're looking at data from, uh, from 2000s and you're less likely to have an MRI or PET scanner, less likely to have teaching hospitals, less likely to have specialty surgeons. Those data supported the concept that specialization is important. So now we know volume is important and specialization is important. As I just said, when there's a problem, there's opportunity, right? There's opportunity to improve when one identifies a problem. So the first part of the world that I'm aware of that really put an effort to saying, we've identified a problem, we need to fix it, was Scandinavia and my Dear friend, the late Lars Palman looked at this issue, uh, assessing rectal cancer cases in his unit in Uppsala, Sweden, uh, over this 20 year period. Starting in 1980, care of rectal cancer was limited to a colorectal unit. So that people who were not specialists were no longer taking care of rectal cancer care after the first six years of the study. And the local recurrence rate decreased from 47% when it was anyone taking care of rectal cancer to 13% when it was only colorectal specialists. And survival increased. In another study from uh, Sweden, also Ken Smed looked at comparison of outcomes after and before or before and after specialization units were introduced. 
and there were improvements in the five-year and 10-year overall survival uh, when specialization was increased. As you can see here, uh, the, the change in cumulative survival bumping up with time, pretty much at every single time point, being better with specialist care. And it was introduced in other countries too. Norway, similar studies. Some of the byproducts found, which undoubtedly were associated with or, 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 the, or resulted in these improved results, were better adherence to TME when specialist care was introduced. That resulted in local recurrence rate decrease, overall survival increase. Similar for the Netherlands, lower rates of permanent stoma, lower local recurrence, better overall survival. Many, many European countries were able to implement this center of excellence model. <laughs> Excuse me. So in the U.S., 12 years ago, when I was president-elect of the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, uh, I was asked by Cesar Ramsey, my counterpart in Ohio, that, that while you're going to have the opportunity as president-elect and, and president of ASDRS, maybe you can do something about this problem. And it had been previously tried. One of my mentors from Minnesota, David Rothenberger, uh, but he went about it a bit of a different approach. Um, so when I put this consortium together, I wanted it to be multidisciplinary, and I didn't want to limit it to colorectal surgeons per se, but to surgeons specializing in rectal cancer care, which may have been people who are fellows of the Society of Surgical Oncology or SAGES, or the Society uh, for Surgery of the Alimentary Tract, um, or the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons. In addition, because we're looking at perioperative care, we didn't include the uh, American Society for Clinical Oncology for Chemotherapy. We didn't in, uh, include ASTRA, the American Society for uh, uh, Radiation Oncology. We limited it to perioperative. So we did include the College of American Pathologists and, and Mariana Berho. Uh, our chief of pathology and lab medicine, our chief of staff, was the CAP representative. And we included also the American College of Radiology, who in turn asked the uh, Society for Abdominal Imaging to get involved. So we had all these perioperative facets covered. So these six groups, the idea was to get together and present to the Commission on Cancer, which is one of the quality programs in the Division of Research and Optimal Patient Care of the American College of Surgeons, and so I'll show you that went. So all these groups presented to the COC and the ACS with the goal of improving quality and uniformity of rectal cancer care in the U.S. Our tool for um, showing people that this program was needed was the National Cancer Database. The NCDB started by David Winchester, the uh, former director of cancer programs in American College Surgeons, and, and David started this program in 1989. Uh, through 2018, there was over 38 million cancer cases diagnosed and entered. The five-year-old call for data resulted in another million and a half new cases, uh, and a total of 8.8 uh, .8 existing cases were updated. So the math becomes mind-boggling because the, for each patient, the National Cancer Database captures 250 data points. So the amount of research you can do here is, is limitless. It's unbelievable. It is the world's largest treasure trove repository of cancer data. So we use that information to create our uh, optimal resources for rectal care standards. And basically what we showed was that we, we, we needed the team to work together. We knew from the European data if the team worked together, there's the best chance of optimizing care for the patient throughout the country. So there's a rectal cancer multidisciplinary team that has to meet a minimum of every other week because it's important no patient is treated, no patient begins treatment until all of their particulars, as I'll show you in a moment, are discussed at the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer Multidisciplinary Team Meeting. Nobody. It's not the old days if somebody comes to me as a surgeon and I say, oh, we're going to do a low anterior section next week. No, I say, I think we're going to do a low anterior section. I don't think you're going to get chemo and radiation. However, I will defer to the wisdom of the crowd. Surgeons, pathologists, radiation oncologists, radiologists, medical oncologists. I will defer to these people that will be having a discussion 
and the consensus of the group will be the direction we take, which I think will be straight to surgery, but it, it may not. And and so we give people um, the, uh, the, as I call it, the, the wisdom of the crowd, and we give them the benefit of all of the knowledge of all of the people in the room. And there are minimum standards set for attendance because it's not going to be good if people don't show up. There's inconsistency. And those are our minimum uh, standards. What we do, as I just mentioned, is we have to confirm the diagnosis. So we're going to sit with the, um, uh, the pathology slides. If for some reason we can't get the slides, at the very least the report. If we can't get the report or the slides, we re -biopsy. It's very important, mandatory that the program confirms the diagnosis of rectal cancer before the initiation of treatment and that the patient is appropriately staged. And that staging occurs at the meeting. How is that staging done? A CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, a rectal cancer protocol, thin slice, high resolution, and in many cases, diffusion-weighted uh, MRI of the rectal cancer, DEA, biopsy, as I just showed, um, plus any other adjunct studies that are needed. So starting with the MRI, we follow the protocol of Gina Brown, and this is Gina from the UK, from the Royal Marston Hospital at, at Imperial College, and she really revolutionized the imaging of rectal cancer, because prior to Gina, it was rectal ultrasound or maybe a CAT scan, but it was not MRI, and MRI is far more sensitive at telling us the depth of invasion of the tumor and can also find things like uh, extra, extramural vascular invasion, which are uh, is a very important prognostic feature to know. The other thing that Gina introduced was a synoptic report so that it's not free text. You're not just narrating as a radiologist and hope you capture all the important points, but you're forced to go through a synoptic report in a template and enter everything. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The same is true for pathology and for surgery. CEA testing required. We need CEA. It says the testing is recommended, but we must have the CEA value. And so we sit down with all of these things and we make a, a, a treatment recommendation summary and a treatment evaluation recommendation summary and then the definitive treatment can begin because it's a team effort and that's the importance of the standards is that we work together as a team in addition the surgery so so the radiology is covered by a synoptic report the pathology is a synoptic report on top of that we um, expect that a minimum of 80% of the proctectomy is performed for cancer by a named member of the MDT. So if you have a surgeon at your hospital who's operating a rectal cancer, they should be part of the MDT. You can't have people excluded or it's not going to be a fair representation. And again, we also use standardized synoptic reports. Um, the interesting thing about the, the uh, modules so for pathology, for radiology, and for surgery, all of us must pass our educational modules by our respective societies. The American College of Radiology with the Society of Abdominal Imaging created a module that radiologists must complete. The College of American Pathologists has an educational module. We as colorectal surgeons have a module created by the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, and we all must have completed and passed those educational modules to be part of the NAPRC MDT or else we can't participate. Why are these synoptic reports so important? Well, I mentioned free text and when somebody dictates, they may capture, for example, the intactness of the mesorectum in three quarters or the distance uh, to the circumferential resection margin, which in this day and age would uh, determine the use of any uh, adjuvant or neadjuvant therapy it depends if it's uh, where it's being done for patients that total neoadjuvant. But nonetheless, three-quarter capture. But when a synoptic report is used, 100% capture. So you can't exit without putting in the data. And that's why it's important. So um, Samantha Hedren from, from Stanford uh, introduced these, these uh, sorry, Samantha Hedren from Michigan, rather, 
um, looked at these rectal cancer operative reports over the period of June to December 2018 from 10 hospitals through the Michigan Surgical Quality Collaborative, where she is in Michigan. They looked at 110 operative reports, and in only 28% of those reports were all the 24 elements of our synoptic report included. And our synoptic report was created by Arden Morris from Stanford. That synoptic report, 28%. Um, when the synoptic template was used, we went up to 92%. Well, not we, but the people in Michigan. I wasn't part of the study. So an increase from 28% to 92% uh, when synoptic reports were used. So there's Arden Morris from Stanford, and here's the report we used. It's in our electronic uh, health record, whether that's Epic, Cerna, or otherwise, whatever the electronic system is, there is a version of our uh, NAPRC report. I go to my electronic medical record. I type under operative report dot NAPRC, and this report comes up, and it's all pop up. So I would populate the ASA score, the case data, what operation I did, how I did it, uh, where was the tumor, both within the rectum and then the height from the anal verge. Did I mobilize the splenic flexure? At what level did I divide the artery and the vein, and so on? You can read down all these things and. And then there's a narrative operative report to go with it as well, which can be long or short at the surgeon's discretion. So there's the pre-treatment recommendation summary by the NAPRC MDT. And then after surgery, there's the post-surgical treatment outcome discussion. And then a plan for whether or not there's any adjuvant therapy. Now, I will tell you our standards are in constant flux. Our first standards were released in 2017, so after six years of, of working on it, and I, and I can go through a little bit of the history of that, we started our group in 2011. Uh, in 2014, three years later, uh, I was a member of the Board of Regents, as, as you saw, for the American College Surgeons, and I was also on the accreditation committee at the time for the Commission on Cancer, now I'm on the Executive Committee. But I presented to the Accreditation Committee, the need for this program in May of 2014. And it was approved and was approved by the Executive Committee. And then in May, uh, in June rather, uh, a month later in 2014, I presented to the Board of Regents asking that the ACS fund this program. And the funding was granted, the Regents approved, and, and it became the first, the NAPRC became the first organ specific quality program introduced by the college. There is the National Accreditation Program for Breast Centers, but that program does not require Commission on Cancer accreditation by the overall hospital, and ours does. The prerequisite to NAPRC accreditation is COC accreditation. So that was 2014. We worked on the standards uh, from 2014 to 2017. We put out a beta test in 2017 for public comments. And then we had uh, six sites with trial surveys, including us, who was one of the six in the country for trial beta test. And then we rolled out the actual programs in, in 2018 with new standards, which were again modified in 2020. So since 2020, there's been a big shift from adjuvant to neoadjuvant to total neoadjuvant. So we are currently rewriting the standards because the post-surgical treatment outcome discussion summary may not result in adjuvant therapy because the patient already had total knee adjuvant. Plus, there's, of course, circulating tumor DNA that's been introduced and other things that have changed. Moreover, here it says post-surgical treatment, but the patient may not get surgery. In this era with wait and watch, the consensus may be uh, to wait and watch, in which case, the patient um, would um, uh, ha have the consensus say, wait and watch on this schedule, and then we're presenting at a later date based upon the, the wait and watch protocol, not based upon the patient having surgery. So I mentioned to you already, all of us have to do our uh, educational modules. So uh, Judith Yi from the American College of Radiology, uh, had her society with the Society of Abdominal Imaging create a phenomenal program. Mariana Berho uh, for the College of American Pathologists 
And the AFCS program was a, a joint effort over the years. First, Connor Delaney, who is our CEO here in Florida, uh, was the chair of the rectal cancer committee uh, for the AFCS and became president. And he handed the reins off to uh, Scott Strong, used to be on our faculty in Ohio, now at Northwestern, and then on to uh, Samantha Hendren, who I already mentioned. So we all need to be educated. This is part of the standards. There is a standard requiring that we understand TME, that the pathologists understand reporting and the radiologists understand looking at the specimens. And does it matter? You know, here's a study that, uh, again, our Arden Morris, who devised the, uh, I showed you a photo, and she just devised our electronic health record pop-up NAPRC menu. 37 surgeons from 14 institutions put a pre-implementation operative report for their patients, 180 patients. Uh, 32 of the 37 also participated after the synoptic reports came to be. So prior to the synoptic reports, the type of reconstruction, the distal margin were reported in less than half the cases, but after implementation, each item was present in, in over at least 89%. So, you know, there were some grousing. People felt there was perhaps some time constraints, but overall the quality of what we are able to capture and therefore the importance for the patient's follow-up and prognosis is key. Now, who assesses the specimen for that synoptic report is really, really important. Um, if we look at this study from the German Oakham trial, you find that there's a, a concordance in most cases between the pathologist and the surgeons grading TME. But when there is a discrepancy and the pathologist called the TME incomplete, there was a higher local occurrence rate, lower overall survival, whereas the surgeon's view didn't seem to correlate with reality. So in other words, we can't grade our own specimens. It is inappropriate for us to say, oh, this looks beautiful, this is a completed TME. You need an external auditor, and that external auditor is indeed the pathologist. And you can see the, the German Oakham study plotted out here, disease-free survival, so you know that a complete or near-complete TME behaves almost identically, and then an incomplete doesn't do nearly as well for disease-free survival and for distant recurrence as well. Um, now, <clears throat> it, I think people realize the importance of getting their centers accredited when they look at the data. So the National Cancer Database, again, one of the studies we did during this five-year period was to assess 31,000 patients with stage two or three rectal cancer. And we found that, interestingly, most patients were treated in low-volume centers or intermediate-volume centers. Roughly, uh, it, it, you can see here the ratio, uh, almost 24,000 in lower intermediate-volume centers, only 6,500 in high-volume centers, which is unfortunate considering that the highest adherence to evidence-based practice, okay, appropriate use, uh, evidence-based guided, appropriate use of, of new adjuvant or adjuvant therapy in this time uh, was in high volume centers. So again, it's like we looked at earlier from the UK and Helen Dorrance's data, there's vast differences in expected outcomes, but do the patients know it? And are the, sur are the surgeons and the centers honest with it? Um, here's another one where we found that our rate of circumferential resection margin positivity in the U.S. is 17 percent, with tremendous variation again, and not associated with neoadjuvant. 17 percent, very, very high. So we started, as I said, in, in 2011, our discussions. In 2014, we went to the, I went to the uh, Commission on Cancer and subsequently the ACS Board of Regions. And we started out with six beta test centers, including Cleveland Clinic Florida in, in 2017. In 2018, uh, we began accrediting programs. As of last month, we had 84 accredited programs in the US. To put that in context, there are about 1,500 Commission on Cancer accredited programs in the US. So at those 1,500 programs, Roughly 85% uh, of all newly diagnosed cancers in our 320 million uh, 
person population in the U.S. Roughly 85% of, of new cancers are treated at COSP centers. We would expect about 200 centers ultimately. We do not expect 1,500 COSP accredited centers are going to want to become NHCRC accredited. But we do suspect that about 200 ultimately will. The society is participating, as I already showed you, the American College of Surgeons, Commission on Cancer, ASDRS, Radiologists, SSCC, SSO, Stages, and College of American Pathology. So, what has happened with it? You know, what, what is what is the evidence with this program that we've created? Um, here is one study where we looked at some measures, performance measures. See, the way any standards work for any quality program: trauma, bariatrics, pediatrics, breast cancer, rectal cancer, COC is there are performance measures and there are process measures. The process measures are you need to have in place a director, uh, a coordinator. You need to have these five disciplines in attendance, radiology, pathology, medical oncology, radiation oncology, surgery. Those are process measures. And when the site surveyors come, they can very simply tick off, yes, this person has this job and the attendance for the radiologist was for each one more than the 30% required and so on. Then there are performance measures, like how did you actually do a thing? And this performance measure was 12 lymph nodes. So when we looked at this study um, through the um, NCDB, we found that all process measures were only met in 28% of cases. So these are things I've been talking about, clinical staging with CAT scan, chest, abdomen, pelvis, thin slice rectal cancer protocol, uh, pelvic MRI, maybe diffusion weighted, CEA, so on and so forth, 28%. Then when we look at the nodes, 73, only 73%. And all process measures achieved in only 56%. So there are big gaps in achieving the optimal outcome for our patients, at least in the surrogate early metric. This, these data have nothing to do with local recurrence of survival, but the assumption is if you do the right thing early on, you're going to have the best outcome later on. So we asked people how they were doing. We surveyed them. They had an anonymous questionnaire to uh, 328 institutions interested in potentially becoming accredited. The mean compliance was only half of the 20 standards, 10 standards. 100% compliance was achieved in only four out of 328 centers all of which were high volume centers. So again, volume speaks volumes as it were for outcomes. The higher the volume, the more likely to adhere to standards. Um, this is an interesting one that um, was presented by my colleagues in, in Ohio and none of them were in leadership in the ASTRS. So there's nothing here that uh, suggests any conflict of interest. And basically what they did is they looked at 408 consecutive rectal cancer cases presented at their colorectal cancer multidisciplinary team conference over a one-year period. And the surgeon going into the room, so Luca Stokey, Ian Lavery, David Liska, Emre Gorgon, uh, and Matthew Kaledi, all of these people went in with a preconceived notion of what they planned to do to the patient. And there were changes of management in 26%. So basically, one out of four patients, there was a change in plan by this discussion and the wisdom of the crowd. And what was very interesting is the changes were just as likely to occur if the surgeon was junior surgeon, mid-career, or later career uh, practice. So everybody would change. And they felt that these data very strongly supported the NAPRC. Now, so, so the real the million dollar question, or maybe these days it's a billion dollar question, can we move the needle? If we adhere to these standards, can we make things better? So almost 50,000 patients again from the NCDB and we use six process measures this time. We wanted to make sure the proximal and distal margins were assessed, that the patient was treated, if treatment initiated within 60 days of diagnosis, Circumferential resection margin was assessed. There was clinical staging. Tumor regression graded grading was noted. So whether it's Dvorak or whatever grading to use for tumor regression grade and CEA. And it turned out that in only 23% of cases in the uh, out of these almost 50,000 patients in the NCDB were all process measures achieved. Okay, 23%. 
So what we then did some mathematical modeling and said, you know, if, if all of these processes had been had been followed in all of these patients rather than 26%, roughly 600 lives a year would be saved. So we're able to convert, at least mathematically early on, uh, the real value in the program or, or, or some of it. Um, you know, the, the thing is, who's going to achieve it? And, and this is a study, again, that nobody who's in NAPRC leadership participated in it, so it's not a self-serving study, but looking at 1,315 hospitals, Again, there's only 84 accredited hospitals. And at this point of the study, there may have been 10 accredited hospitals. But nonetheless, without NAPRC accreditation, 13 or 15 hospitals, only 3% met the five important process standards and 17% uh, met four standards, which resulted in uh, improved mortality in the higher volume centers. Again, same thing we've said several times, volume relates to outcome. Um, regional surgery, this is another one that's been looked at, you know, are we ready to regionalize? Um, there was, this is an interesting study that was done with kind of mathematical modeling at, out of Yale. Regionalized surgery is definitely less expensive and has better outcomes, but the cost of travel has to exceed $15,000 to achieve cost effectiveness, which is a problem. So not everybody can afford to travel, even though the outcomes will be better. Okay. The, the care is less expensive to the system, but the cost to the patient may be more by traveling. So I, I've deliberately tried to limit this to 45 minutes of chatting. So I know we have plenty of time for questions and discussion, but the standardization of care and the establishment of high volume standards with trained People. And I don't mean just trained surgeons, trained radiologists, trained pathologists, trained surgeons, improves care in rectal cancer. The standards have been applied, developed and applied by the American College of Surgeons and the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer. And the data support the, that high volume specialized standards will have the best outcomes, both oncologically and economically. Now, one might ask, and this is particularly germane in, in India, and it's as it is in Latin America, Southeast Asia, uh, and other parts of the world, Eastern and Central Europe, we don't have these accreditation programs. We don't have the resources. How do we do it? Well, my answer is always just focus on following these standards. No, you're not going to have a certificate of accreditation, but focus on following these standards, and you will offer your patients the same benefits as if you were accredited. Now, I... I I was very impressed earlier to hear uh, that the Sanatapan Foundation is, is not for profit and it's helping uh, people throughout the, uh, the world uh, better themselves uh, educationally as surgeons. And I'll, I'll take the opportunity. You can QR scan this if you like. Um, I put a meeting together with a variety of groups, the uh, Cleveland Clinic and, and uh, MD Anderson. Uh, so the two institutions, Cleveland Clinic and MD Anderson, the Indian Association for Surgical Oncology is one of these groups, along with the Brazilian Society of Surgical Oncology, the UK, the British Association for Surgical Oncology, Association of Cancer Surgery, International Society for Restless Guided Surgery, International Society for Surgery of the Pleural Peritoneum, Peritoneal Surface Oncology Group International, the Italian Society of uh, Surgical Oncology, the European Society of Coloproctology. We're about to meet in Vilnius, Lithuania in a couple of days the U.S. Society of Surgical Oncology, the European Society of Surgical Oncology, the International Association of Endocrine Surgery, and the International Hepatopancreatic Gobiliar Association. This huge consortium, we're putting on a meeting in Jerusalem, and we're offering scholarships. I've been raising money from friends and donors, and we are offering $5,000 scholarships for surgeons from um, low income and lower middle income countries. So according to the World Bank, there are two tiers of country. You can find the information on our website. So surgeons from developing countries will be able to come on scholarships to benefit from the meeting. And in addition, uh, we also have um, the same scholarships available for surgeons in training from any country, US, UK, Canada, Australia, it doesn't matter. So scholarships available to attend our global uh, surgical oncology summit. 
So I've deliberately left some time for questions. Again, I thank you for the opportunity to present and I look forward to lively discussion about the topic. Excellent, wonderful presentation, um, uh, Dr. Steven Wexner. Uh, thank you once again for accepting our invitation and really, we are really honored to have you here. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Dr. Prakash, you can take the questions. We can chat with the uh, professor. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful presentation. And uh, uh, we all appreciate the points you have emphasized upon the standardization, imaging, the pathology, the volume of the surgeon, and the standardization of surgical care. Uh, to start the uh, discussion, uh, let's take one point which we uh, commonly face in our clinical practice. Uh, with, in terms of radiology, we can discuss with the radiologist, and uh, it's not very difficult. But when it comes to the pathology, Particularly, it's not about the margins, particularly uh, about the lymph node count uh, when the specimens get reported. We find quite a, a wide range of uh, variation from pathologist to pathologist. So what all measures do you employ to, uh, to emphasize or uh, to ensure the uh, standard of care in pathology reporting in terms of lymph node counts as well as margin? That's uh, one question which always comes to our minds. Well, I, I think for one thing, the modules are publicly available. So I think any pathologist can go to the College of American Pathologists website and download and uh, become educated in TME assessment. There are supplemental data available, additional educational uh, information available from the um, 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 COC itself, so on the COC and NAPRC website. So there's a lot of resources, number one. Number two, I think we also need to give positive feedback to our pathologists. And I think they need to be aware of the importance. I think if they understand the relation of carefully assessing the mesorectum and the distal margin and the radial margin and the number of nodes and tumor regression grade and so on, they understand the relation to the outcome of the patient. Most pathologists do want to do the right thing. I think they all want to do the right thing for the patient, but they may not understand necessarily the importance, and they think of it as just ticking a box. There are adjunct techniques they can use. They can ink the radial margin before they bread loaf it. They can use fat clearance techniques, such as xylene or alcohol, to increase the nodal yield. And, and sometimes what's best is if we show them and we take an interest and we go to the lab with the specimen ourselves and say, here's the information I need. Here's why I need it. Let's look at it together. I think most pathologists will respond. And in fact, I know Dr. Berho has gone around the country and in fact the world uh, working with pathologists to, to bring them up to the standard. And, and she always makes a point of saying, you're going to be the pathologist and the surgeon working together. In fact, even better if you can get the radiologist and then you're looking at the MRI too, because, okay, on the MRI, we thought this was a threatened margin. Uh, in fact, it wasn't. So what did we get wrong here? And it becomes an educational experience for the imager who did the MRI and the pathologist. Now, sometimes you get amazing correlation. You say this was extramural vascular invasion on the slide and, you, and, and then you, on the, sorry, on the image, the MRI, and then you do a bread loaf section and you see it exactly where it was called. So that education as a group is what's important. We bring that to the level of doing it at our weekly NAPRC MDT. So every single um, image for the patient is shown on the screen like this with our you know, Zoom uh, meeting uh, these days. Everything's shown on the screen. And then we look at the pathology specimen and we compare. Right? So we say, you know, this was okay, this is an exact concordance, or if it's not, we go back and we look as a group. Well, so do you think um, uh, you'll have to change uh, the pattern of uh, adjuvant therapy if the pathological specimen is inferior? The pathologist? Pathological specimen is inferior to what, the, what is expected. Do you want to change your uh, uh, post-operative strategy? You mean if it's an incomplete mesorectum? Yeah. Well, it, it would depend if the patient already had total neoadjuvant therapy, which in this day and age most people do. 
there's not really anything left to do because you've kind of maxed them out on therapy. Um, you know, it, it would be different if there's a positive circumferential resection margin versus just an incomplete TME. So if there's an incomplete TME, but it was a T2 lesion and, and there's no circumferential resection margin positive, that patient's probably going to do fine. And, and we just actually published that in disease of the colon rectum, I think, this month. Um, that the incomplete specimens don't seem to really be so concerning as long as there's not a positive margin. Different story for the positive circumferential resection margin. That's a patient who is at very high risk of local recurrence. And so if that patient has not had maximum radiation and chemo, you're going to give it, uh, at least consider giving it. You're going to very closely follow that patient. And if they do come with a local recurrence, that may be somebody who's going to end up with an acceleration uh, and or intraoperative radiation therapy. Uh, Dr. Arlipan wanted you, to ask, ask some question. Dr. Arlipan, can you please uh, unmute your mic and ask the question? <clears throat> yes, sir. Thank you very much for this presentation. I just want to really... Especially uh, thanks uh, to the Professor Stephen Waxner for this uh, really good presentation and giving us a lot of information about how is important actually to work in teamwork and to uh, employ all the standards which they are possible for the surgery. I have actually a question and I want to go just to the beginning and ask uh, uh, the professor about, uh, he said about the difference between the general surgeon and the colorectal surgeon. And he said that the <clears throat> possibility of uh, recurrence from the technical, uh, um, actually to the uh, surgical techniques that he uses could be uh, much higher than the colorectal surgeon. And I wanted to ask, I mean, how is going to be possible to employ all the standards when we know that the number of the colorectal surgeons are less than the general surgeon and especially in the places and countries which they cannot actually afford to go to this kind of uh, specific training so this is going to be a big problem how do you see that the other uh, communities in surgery and people can actually deal with this and i also have another question if it's possible uh, i wanted to ask the professor from his experience uh, did he, I mean, that's a long experience of 35 years. Uh, what was the the most difficult uh, surgical resection that, that he did? And he actually used the standards that he mentioned all, all, all the way. And did he see any kind of improvements, improvements in uh, patient's life quality and, of course, length? Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. So uh, the first part of the question is general surgeons versus colorectal. Now, one of the things I did when I put this program together was be very careful to ensure that people are not exclusively colorectal surgeons. That's why we have SAGES involved, Society for Surgery of the Alimentary Tract, Society for Surgical Oncology. There are people who did not do training but have specialized their practice in caring for rectal cancer. So they trained in general surgery. Maybe then they did a fellowship in minimally invasive surgery or surgical oncology, but their practice focuses on colorectal. That's okay. It doesn't necessarily have to be a colorectal fellowship, but it has to be somebody who is focused all of their skill, all of their skills on working with rectal cancer, not somebody whose practice is mostly doing hemorrhoidectomies and once a year taking care of a rectal cancer. So although it's ideal to have both, it may not be possible. But what somebody should do is devote their practice to caring for rectal cancer. So they are familiar with pelvic anatomy. They're familiar with reconstructive options. They have access to uh, whatever is necessary, whether it's transvenal total mesorectal extrusion or a hand-sewn uh, transvenal colloidal anastomosis or colonic shape. Have somebody who understands what the options are for sphincter sparing surgery, somebody who has the resources and will follow up uh, these patients with weight and watch, offer them weight and watch protocol for a organ preservation technique. It's all of those things. So yes, training's ideal, but realizing it's not always possible, that's okay. You know, focus of practice becomes what's important. 
uh, firstly. Secondly, in, in terms of patients, I mean, a absolutely, we've seen differences. We've seen patients, I, I see it fairly often, where I examine the patient in the office, and I think, you know, this is somebody who maybe could go straight to surgery. This is a mid-rectal cancer. It seems very mobile and soft uh, on exam. Uh, there's no adverse features histopathologically. There's no lymphovascular invasion. There's no tumor budding. It's, it's well differentiated. And then we get the studies and we find, oh, there's a liver lesion. Or um, actually, this, there's a, a threatened circumferential margin, despite what it felt like. You know, the anterior peritoneal reflection, for example. Well, then we have to tell the patient, gee, you know, something you will benefit from neoadjuvant therapy. And patients understand that. So, yeah, I've seen dramatic improvements because then I have some patients who end up having complete resolution through that TNT, and we do wait and watch protocol, and they have organ preservation. And then I have other patients who probably would have had, it's impossible to know for sure, but probably would have had a positive circumferential resection margin and had a negative margin because of TNT that based on my exam, I wouldn't have necessarily called. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah, Dr. Alban. Thank um, you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mr. Rahmatullah has uh, raised his hand. So. Uh, Dr. Rahmatullah, can you please unmute? Uh, hello, uh, are you hearing me? Yeah, yes, please, absolutely. Please introduce and uh, ask the question. Okay. Uh, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, great presentation. I am so happy to joining you in this time. My question is about the uh, rectal cancer distal margin in uh, lower uh, anterior resection. Usually we perform uh, laparoscopic uh, uh, lower anterior resection, laparoscopic rectal cancer mm -hmm. uh, here in uh, Iran University of Medical Science, the Suleyakram Hospital. But uh, 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 I want to know about the uh, margin uh, for the distally to the um, uh, um, cancer and uh, how uh, and uh, how centimeter between the sphincter and the mass we can to uh, reject the mass and uh, in uh, rectal cancer thank you yeah thank you for the question and thanks for the compliment um firstly we used to think it was a five centimeter distal margin but based on the work of norman williams uh john nichols uh, Bill of Quirk and Pathology, we discovered back in the mid-1980s that it's not the five centimeter distal margin that was necessary because patients who had tumor more than two centimeters distal to distal margin uh, died of, of metastatic disease with nothing to do with local recurrence, and it was very rare to begin with. So the margin got whittled down to two. Now, there are plenty of studies in the literature, including ours from, from Cleveland Clinic, showing even less than one centimeter. Essentially, just a, a microscopic margin is satisfactory, but you shouldn't aim for that. You should aim for two centimeters, realizing that one is probably acceptable. Uh, you know, Bill Heald has one article called The Close Shave. Eight millimeters was the number he came up with. But again, if you, if you try and aim for eight millimeters, you may come up with, with one millimeter, which probably isn't ideal. Uh, so I think always aim for two, knowing you may need to settle for one. And the difference between a one centimeter margin and uh, avoiding a colostomy for the patient is huge. So if you say, well, I insist on two, but it's going to be a colostomy, I don't think that's the right approach. I think one centimeter is fine. And there's a lot of techniques we use now to help us get that margin. Uh, transanal total mesoric excision is certainly one of them. Uh, that, that we can use, but even before that, what was described by Alan Parks a long time ago in the interesting Terrac resection. And uh, certainly Eric Roulier in France has classified the levels of interesting Terrac resection, whether you're doing a partial or a total interesting Terrac resection. Those things are possible, 
what the patient has to understand when they're having an anastomosis at that level, particularly if some of the internal sphincter is being removed, their bowel function is not going to be what it was prior to the diagnosis of rectal cancer. Uh, they're going to have low anterior section syndrome, and they may have an urgency, and they may have incontinence. Even if the total neoadjuvant therapy is pre-op and there's no post-op radiation, they need to understand that. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, next, uh, Dr. Manish has raised his hand. Before that, we have some interesting questions in the chat box also. Most of it uh, is, to, is to thank you for the wonderful presentation. So thank you very much, sir. And one thank particular you. question which, uh, which I found is about the lateral pelvic node dissection. And uh, one uh, chat box discussion is about intraarterial injection of ICG to preserve the, uh, to identify the nerves and to preserve the TME plane. Your comments about that and after that, Dr. Manish. Using ICG for what purpose? He has asked for intra-arterial injection of uh, ICG, maybe to infer a mesenteric artery, to identify the dissection planes and lateral nodes and uh, no harm. Yeah, I, I, I think that I, I've, I've not used it for planes. I mean, the total mesorectal excision plane is pretty straightforward. It's a nice surreal or plane posteriorly that lifts up. Uh, so I've not used it for that purpose. I do use ICG to check anastomotic perfusion, always. Um, and I do for anterior sections always, and I do use it for ureteric identification because it really helps to see the ureters and save time. Um, and those things have been published in uh, surgery in a, in a supplement we had in December 2022 uh, from the International Society for Us with Guided Surgery. We published uh, in all the different facets of surgery, endocrine surgery, HCV surgery, colorectal surgery. Separately, um, it can be used for lateral nodes. It's, it's not something that in the U.S. is yet labeled for general and colorectal surgery. It is labeled for GYN. So some people are doing it, and it, it does probably have a role for lateral pelvic node dissection. Having said that, if you're going to do a lateral node dissection, you're probably going to clean out all the compartments. If you're going for a kind of cherry picking after certain nodes, then for sure it's good. Okay, thank you, sir. And uh, Dr. Manish, Dr. Manish, you can. Hello, uh, good evening, sir. Uh, excellent presentation. Uh, I have a small doubt uh, for a lateral pelvic nodes. If it is upfront uh, positive and uh, after CTRT it responds well, so whether to go ahead with uh, nodal dissection or whether to just explore the area and see if suspicious, then we do for nodal dissection. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, thank you. And, and that indeed is a hotly debated topic. But I, my view of it is it's kind of like the tumor overall. If you have a T2 or T3 tumor, even if it's node positive, and you get a complete response, uh, imaging by MRI is complete response, by digital exam is complete response, by endoscopy is complete response, probably you're going to offer that patient organ preservation, wait and watch. So I think it's the same with the nodes. Let's say you're still going in to operate, but I don't think you need to operate on the nodes if you've had complete imaging resolution of those nodes. That's my, you know, that's my opinion. And I don't think that debate is yet settled, uh, but I, I would tend to go by, by the imaging after the uh, neoadjuvant therapy has been administered. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vikar Kottecha is our Tanzanian ambassador. Uh, Dr. Vikar, can you please unmute? Yes, thank you, Dr. Stephen, um, for a nice presentation. I have a very uh, simple question, and um, it is that when would be the best time to count the lymph nodes um, after a colonic resection or rectal resection? Um, and I ask this because there are several times the pathologists would ask us to count the lymph nodes on a, on a fresh specimen rather than a fixed specimen um, in the laboratory. I don't know what is your comment on that. Fixed. When you look at the educational module from Cosmer Pathologist, it is a fixed specimen. Um, if you use alcohol fixation in particular, the nodes pop out as, as white. Very, very easy to see, and I think you're far less apt to miss them. So, nodes in the fixed specimen. 
Okay, and my second question is, um, when the pathologist is slicing the specimen, what is the recommended distance uh, in which they need to slice? Because there are times when we visit them and say to look for margins and the whole tumor. They'll say that we don't slice uh, too much and they pick it at random places. So is there a guide for slicing the specimen? Yeah, that's an excellent point. I, I, I think the pathologists slice as thin as they possibly can. Uh, when I, I, I don't know if it's <clears throat> two millimeters or so, I'm guessing. But the, the slice should be almost translucent, it, it, that you could hold it to the light and almost see through it. It's as thin as possible because that's going to give you the most information. Now, you don't have to do that throughout the length of the resected specimen, but you do have to do that from just distal to the tumor, maybe a centimeter distal to the tumor to a centimeter proximal. So through that, through the tumor itself, it should be as thin as possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. The, the most questions are about the, the distal margin and the, uh, uh, the margin according to the differentiation. I think most of it has been covered. Uh, and uh, uh, one more, Dr. Karsi Zana Alam had raised his hand. So yeah, Dr. Karsi, can you please unmute? Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Yeah, good evening, my sir, and thank you very much for arranging such an excellent uh, uh, webinar for us, and thanks to excellent present, thanks for excellent presentation, Dr. Steve. Uh, Dr. Steve, uh, I had a question regarding the very good TMA uh, specimen. Which energy sources you prefer to have a very good uh, TME? Uh, does uh, are there any study uh, that uh, uh, the use of various energy sources uh, make the difference uh, between the TME uh, between having a very good TME? Play. Thank I'm you. I'm not sure I completely get that. I showed the German study showing that you know, how TME uh, correlated with, with low carbs and survival. Is there something else? Uh, no, so uh, I'm I'm asking the use of energy sources. Oh, uh, energy like sources. Now, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Someone is doing this section with the diatomy, a simple monopolar. Some use uh, the other energy sources, of advanced energy sources. Are there any difference of having a very good TME plane uh, when the energy sources varies? I, I don't believe so. I, I've not seen any data that it matters if it's done with scissors, uh, monopolar, diathermy, harmonic, uh, scalpel, bipolar, I, I, I've not seen any data. And we had, not for rectal cancer, but for J pouches, we did publish a study a few years back uh, looking at energy sources versus like clips and ties and staple for J pouches, the, the store of rectal We found the energy sources were, were associated with, with less blood loss and quicker surgery and, and shorter ileus. That's not rectal cancer. Uh, Dr. Alvin, do you want to ask uh, one more question? Your hand is still raised. Uh, I'm sorry. I am just getting down my Okay, then, Dr. Kotfia. Uh, uh, Kotfia. No, I think Hello? it's uh, some kind of mistake. Okay. Uh, Dr. Amaravani. Hudayfa, Hudayfa Saraf. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. Steven, thank you very much for your lecture. I just want to ask you, what is the criteria for transanal uh, TME uh, in your, uh, uh, from your side? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I, I think it's it's a tool, <laughs> one way to do it. And I, I personally think the, the best candidates for TATME are the obese patients, obese male patients with distal lesions where it might be hard laparoscopically or robotically to get distal to the tumor with an adequate margin, uh, particularly an anterior tumor in, a, in an obese male. I think those are very good cases. However, whoever is doing the bottom of the TATME can't exclusively do those cases. You have to learn on the easier ones. Then later on, you're held in reserve for those cases. 
Uh, it certainly doesn't add any value for upper rectal cancers. Um, most mid-rectal cancers, not much, but the, but the distal ones and the obese males can be helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Hoxia. Hudefa, yes. Yeah, thank you. Yes, thank you for giving this opportunity. I want to ask a uh, professor uh, from his long journey from 1988 to such uh, a big jump in the modalities of the AI and technology and this uh, stuff. Can we see in uh, the future uh, study comparing uh, resulted between uh, laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery implemented by AI or such a thing? Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't personally think there's going to be another study comparing laparoscopy and robotics after the uh, ROLAR trial showed that there was no difference and multiple other trials similarly showed occasionally small differences in, in spectral function or in obese males. But besides to these, these subset analyses, it all seems to be equivalent. So whether you do laparoscopy or robotics, uh, or THEME. I think it's just a matter of what equipment is available and what is the surgical skill set uh, that can be offered to the patient. So I don't think that study is going to be repeated. Could artificial intelligence be added to robotic and laparoscopic? laparoscopic? Yes, absolutely. I think it will be. I think it will help both. Uh, it may be better suited to robotics, potentially. Things like um, identification of lateral pelvic nodes that we discussed earlier, or maybe knowledge of the distal margin somehow with AI being able to tell us this is a patient you could safely take a four millimeter margin versus this is a patient who really needs a one centimeter margin. So I, I think AI could be quite helpful in that in some regards, and robotics may be better suited to it than laparoscopy. Uh, Dr. Sandra Hote. Dr. Prashant, can you please unmute? Yeah, unmuted. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sanadipan. And uh, it was a lifetime experience uh, hearing Steve. Uh, my question is now there are some papers appearing that intraarterial ICG is given. And uh, at the start of the surgery itself, uh, particularly if we are doing the left sided colectomy, then uh, uh, IMA is cannulated by Sledlinger's technique and uh, ICG dye is taken, uh, instilled, and then uh, the embryological plane is visualized. And they are instilling the uh, Yeah, I, again, I've not personally used it in that regard. Uh, it sounds intriguing, but I've not done it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Asher Attar, can you please unmute? Yeah. Dr. Asher? Hello. Yeah. Uh, Sir, so my question is that uh, in which cases you prefer inter resection? And what is your preference performing it open or a, a TAMIS approach or a TAR TME? Thank you, sir. Yeah, I, I would, again, for an interesting teric resection, uh, I would most likely just put a, a retractor, the Lone Star kind of retractor, and retract the anus and, and start either if it's a total interesting teric at the interesting teric groove. Or if it's an upper interesting teric starting at the dentate line, and then just go myself. But and I think those are the toughest cases for TATME because it's hard to keep the port in. When the lesions are that low, I think the TATME approach is very difficult for transanal endoscopic surgery. The port really doesn't want to stay in. I think you're better to face the anus and do it manually and laparoscopically from above. In my case, some people might do it robotic, some might do it open, although I think surgery should. Uh, certainly be minimally invasive and, and very, very difficult to think of a reason to do anything open anymore. Um, so in whom would I do it? To get that margin. So it's somebody where the MRI has shown 
the tumor abutting after total knee action therapy, the tumor is abutting the upper part of the internal anal sphincter. It is not extending into the intersphincteric groove. It is not in any way involving external anal sphincter. Um, the patient has good preoperative sphincter function and understands that their postoperative function is going to be suboptimal, that they are going to have incontinence to, to gas and liquid, possibly to solve stool. They may need, need, need a pad because we're moving part of the internal sphincter. So those are my criteria. Yes, thank you, Professor. Uh, one last uh, chat in the box is about the, do you have the templates for lower income group countries? The templates you were mentioning about the uh, data capturing, is there anything like for lower income countries? For the meeting in January? No, he's asking about the templates to for the data capturing. So you're talking oh, about yeah, uh, you... uh, giving, uh, yes. So yeah, sure. If you... Yes, yes, please. Please go ahead. No, I no, I don't know of any sco scholarships to come learn. Maybe I'm missing the point on this one. Okay. The templates are available for synoptic reports on the NAPRC website. You could, if you go to your browser and you type NAPRC, and I put it throughout my talk, you'll get to the NAPRC, and you'll have all the templates there. If that's the question. Yeah, I think that's fine. That's fine. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, uh, Dr. Abed Alvi, who is the past president of Associated Surgeons of India, is there to ask you some questions. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Stephen. Uh, I see you as a very senior person indulging in colorectal surgery. My question is very simple. I am also as senior as you are. Would you believe in ICG-related vascular supply of colorectal anastomosis or your experience? Yeah, I, I've published my experience a couple of times, in, including annals of surgery in 2021 and surgery, no, sorry, 2022 and 2021 and 2022 in surgery, uh, several videos, uh, most recently this month in colorectal disease. I routinely use ICG to assess the vascularity of all anastomoses performed on the left side, colorectal, coloanal uh, anastomoses routinely. I see somebody's also asking for the QR code, and I think what I'm going to do here. Yeah, is, uh, it's, a, it's okay. I, I'm just doing one case on Wednesday. I just wanted to know your opinion. Thank you so much. I, I use it routinely in that setting, but let me just show the QR because I see somebody's asking me again to get some um, information about the scholarship share screen. Let me just go back and show the QR if I might because somebody's asking. So that, that's the QR. Um, and, uh, for the, and, and if the scholarship information is not on the website, it will be by Tuesday. Uh, but again, we're going to be offering up to $5,000 per surgeon reimbursement for, so the registration will be paid and then reimbursement for travel, hotel meals up to $5,000. Uh, and, you know, if you look at the world bank website, which will be linked through here, it'll, it'll show you if you qualify based on countries, but also available to any surgeon in training. Yeah, the participants can uh, uh, can scan the QR code now. Yeah, I'll leave that a second, and then I'm going to take it down so we can finish up. Okay. Thank you, Professor. All right, thank you. Okay, it's also Dr. good on social Prakash. media. It's also on my Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn. It's also being sent. Dr. Prakash, uh, my final comments. And, uh, yeah, I think uh, it was a wonderful session, and uh, uh, all the aspects of standardization of care in the, in the region of cancer care and the national program uh, details were all shared. Thank you very much for uh, uh, enlightening us for all the details. And thank you uh, all the participants for active participation. And to thank uh, Dr. Baiju and Sanadavan Education Foundation for giving us the opportunity. And over to you, Baiju. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Thank you, Professor Stephen Wexner for accepting our invitation again. Uh, and uh, giving a wonderful lecture on the uh, topic. And uh, uh, we'll be having more questions in the future. I'll be mailing to you uh, to get uh, clarity regarding the questions. So uh, also, uh, uh, we need your blessings in, the, in our future and viewers also. Thank you once again for joining. Thank you, Prakash, and uh, thank you, Dr. Ashna.
thank you all who has joined from um, uh, all the different countries. Probably, I, I think more than 75 countries have participated. And to, uh, to the final words, Dr. Vesna. Well, thank you. It's been an honor and privilege participating. Uh, I'm glad that this is such a lively, interactive group. <laughs> so um, it, this is great. This is much better than me just having lectured for an hour and 15 minutes and left 15 minutes to talk. I'm glad we did it like this. Uh, I congratulate you on this wonderful, wonderful gathering of people from around the world. Uh, I think it's a real service to mankind, you know, what you're doing here. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, we'll sir. meet you somewhere. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, till then, bye. Bye. bye.